Dostane hostě da gašnu mehensko thanks to our tech team. I would like to begin day two with a wonderful performance uh, from our very own grade five students. And this is, uh, they will be performing two pieces that obviously uh, have been directed by our wonderful Messini. Good morning, Messini. And uh, this could not have been done without your help. And when I say your help, obviously I'm talking to the grade five parents. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Collaboration of the Grade Five teachers, Miss Amy Gibbs and Miss Jane Chikaris. And now, if you could give a warm round of applause for the Grade Five students and their beautiful performances. Thank you very much.
uh, and on it it said, you are a pioneer, a founder, and an architect of what's possible. However you feel about Google Glass, that <coughs> sense of excitement I felt about being an architect of possible is exactly how I feel about our work as educators and educational technologists. I want to leave you with this thought once again. You are an architect of the possible. We're thrilled to work with innovative educators like you all over the globe to improve schools using the best technology, the best learning principles available. I hope to see you all online more soon. That, the video is actually about a year ago old. Um, he said 50,000. Last year, in our impact report, we uh, worked with 88,000 teachers around the world, giving uh, um, leading events in 10 different languages. Um, so we're, we're definitely our global network, um, and we like to, to we learn as much from you guys as we like to give back to you. So we, and we would like to take that forward with us as, as we go. So for today, um, the schedule is, as, as it says up here right now, we have a 30 minute break after this session, and then 15 minute breaks in between. We condense it a little bit, we'll try to stay on time as well. Um, make sure that we'll, uh, that you check and refresh the schedule. There have been some changes, and there will be a couple of changes during SWAT and during SWAT's keynote, because that's have to make one more. Um, but we will be uh, updating that, so make sure you check that. But the, the first couple of sessions are set as we're ready to go. I will say, you should look out for it, we are going to have a repeat. Vivian has uh, graciously volunteered to run another breakout EDU session, so if you did not get a chance to do a breakout, that's going to be in session 7. And I will put the link to the sign-up sheet in the description on the schedule, uh, and that will be for me by the end of this keynote. So I'll have another uh, same number of spots as yesterday available if you would like to go and do it. Um, I always say the first rule of breakout is what happens in breakout stays in breakout. Maybe you should go tell everybody the, the answers to the clues and things like that. But uh, it, is a, it is a great opportunity. It's a new uh, learning experience. We've also condensed the, the closing down a little bit. We can teach you guys out here. You get a little bit of your Sunday back, a little bit of time to rest and recuperate after all of this good stuff. Make sure you share your tweet. We had a couple good tweets yesterday um, and uh, some shares out there. Uh, be sure you check our photo, photo pictures as well. We'll be, uh, we'll be sharing these a little bit later at the end of the sun. Congratulations to Lulu Chen!
and share a particular site of address and all of that kind of thing. So you can take a look at those level one, level two certifications. That's where most people should start. Okay? And we're offering more of those around, around the place. Um, certified trainers. If you are uh, like a tech integrator, a tech coach, a tech facilitator, we call it different uh, titles in different, uh, different areas. You can, uh, if your role is to basically provide training to other people, you could be uh, look at the certified trainer program. And then the innovator program at certifiedinnovators.com. This is a very selective program. Um, it takes people in, from all, all cultures, all groups, um, and we have them have, have held them around the world. The last one. I'll talk about where the last one is here in a little bit, but the um, Certified Innovator Program is one that uh, there are events that are held. Um, it varies each year as to how many of these innovator academies are held, but uh, they, they move, move around the place. So at EdTech Team, we support that. We offer uh, boot camps, we call them. One and two day boot camps, which are workshops for small groups of people, um, uh, up to 30 people to a trainer. And as you're, if you're a host of that, of that event, um, you as the host, you get three free tickets. Um, and there's 30 spots, so three of those go to the school for free, and then you sell the other tickets to other people in the community that might want to, to attend as well. And we have those across all of the, those three areas the, the educator level one, two, and the training program. So if you're interested, you can take a look at our RP uh, or our request form that we've got listed up there. Uh, in this area, we don't have any physically in Asia per se, but now that we looked for the, for the uh, foreseeable future, but what we do have, well, the closest one we have is in Abu Dhabi at the beginning of May. Uh, and uh, the, the dates and stuff, you can find all that information on our, on our website, the events. Here's the Innovator Academy, we just closed those applications at the beginning of March, and that will be held in London in April, the Innovator, so that would be really cool. Next, finally, I'd like to introduce Swan Yo, a good friend and an education evangelist at Google, he's based out of Sydney, he's worked all over the world with Google, and he's got some fantastic messages to share with you guys today. So please help me welcome Swan Yo. Everyone else is sort of facing forward, facing the teacher. 
teachers the focal point of the classroom. And so it got me sort of thinking, right, when I, when I took on this role, uh, you know, I've been in my role for, for five years now, um, and I thought about what were some of the things I wanted to do differently, right? I was here, here I am at, a, at a, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world, and I didn't think it was going to make impact. And then I, you know, I came across this quote from, from Mark Twain, right, which talks about the two most important days in your life. And I suspect for many of you as teachers, but maybe you guys have found your calling uh, of why you got into education. Right? Why did you become a teacher in the first place? Right? What, what made you sort of give up whatever other dreams you may have had you know, to become into teaching? Or maybe teaching is your dream. Right? So maybe that's, just, that's the, the second most important day of your life, when you find out why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, so you came up with you know, this idea that you have one job, right? As a teacher, you got to, you know, when you, when you first started teaching, your one job was to teach, right? Uh, so, so what's new? What's changed? Right? You know, I would say over the last couple of years, obviously we've seen uh, technology come into our lives. Uh, we see that you know more and more people are using uh, you know the, the devices that we constantly put to the devices. Right? But, you know, we we have a group, um, thinkwithgoogle.com, where we we do a um, lot of research. Uh, technology research impact. And you know they came out with a statistic of 87% of millennials. Just a quick show of hands, how many of you speak to your cell phone next to you? Yeah, about 87%. Um, you know, always have their smartphones uh, at night, right? In fact, I think the study went on to show also that um, the large majority of these people, the first thing they do when they wake up in the morning is to, it's, it's not to kiss their loved one, if they're you know their partner, but rather to check their, their mobile phone. Uh, which is which is uh, as well. You know, my story, you know, I have, I have a few things I love doing on my phone. Any any Fitbit users here? You know, handful. Okay. So if you see me walking up and down, you know, for no reason, you know, you know that I'm trying to get my steps up. Um, so Fitbit, one of the nice things about Fitbit is the, the community, right? So you get to uh, you know you get to see which of your friends who are using Fitbit also, and and, and go into competitions with them to see who walks the most steps. Uh, and some of are great because you just keep walking up and down all the time. And so I, you know, I wanted to challenge some of these folks uh, and you know, constantly pushing myself to, to one up the next person. Um, and, you know, Uber, anybody use Uber? Uber is your encounter. Anybody use Uber? <coughs> <laughs> 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 yeah, Uber is a great app. Uber is a great app. I live in Australia. It's okay. Let's just talk about Australia. Um, you know, I've been using Uber for a couple of years now, and, and uh, you know, Uber, I don't know if this is, you guys, you can actually find out what your rating is. And then you get to rate the, uh, you get to rate the driver, and the driver gets to rate you. And so, you know, again, same thing, but this thing that, you know, I'm constantly trying to figure out, you know, how do I get my, why are people not rating me as a group passenger? How do I get my, how do I get my rating up? Uh, and, and the last thing, you know, which I do a lot on my phone is, it, um, one second every day. Anyone use one second every day? Love it, love it. Do you, it's, it's, uh, you keep doing it every day? It's hard, right? But you gotta you gotta keep going. So one second every day, if you haven't checked it out, it's just, it's just an app. Uh, it takes one uh, one second video of, of everything you do every day, and, and then you know at the end of the month or the end of the year, you put them all together. It's a really nice collage of all the different things. Uh, so, so check it out one second every day. So you have all these like different snippets of all the things, just like a, a, a video montage uh, at the end of whatever time period you're looking at. I wanna show this uh, I wanna show this video. This is uh, Google Photos, one of my favorite uh, Google apps. Uh, on my phone, obviously you're going to take a lot of pictures, but this, you know, anybody use Google Photos? Okay. I want to show this video which uh, I think will encapsulate when we think about, you know, mobile technology, what it really means. Your great grandfather was a great man, achieved many great things, and took two pictures in his life. Army? What? Army? Well, you just took 36 identical photos of a sunset that you thought was great. Your parents take all their photos in an album. If their house caught on fire, all they have to do is grab the album and boom, memories stay forever. But we, we leave all our photos on our phone, and then leave our phone on this flight to Baltimore. <laughs> Bye, photos. If I love you, have lost a photo in your phone. Chances are you have 20,000 photos taken in all your space. You can have group selfies, self selfies, selfies of people taking selfies, chats, apps, accidental flash, feeds out of your pocket, photos of twins, who you wish you cooked, who you actually cooked, big moments, small moments, Wi-Fi routers, really complicated passwords on them, it's your guy, 
he did something you'd actually remember it. If your great grandfather wanted to show someone a photo of his wedding, you wouldn't have a tough time finding it. But if you want to show off that photo of you and your friend's wedding, good luck scrolling. <laughs> Every photo you've ever taken is safely backed up online for free, so that it didn't take up all the space in your phone. You know, something for the way we actually use photos. Today. You know, we, we, we constantly, you know, on our mobile devices, I love, I love that, I love the video. We're so constantly on our mobile devices. This, this, uh, this roadside is actually, I think, from from think, Sweden, or Denmark, one of these, uh, one of the Nordic countries. And, you know, it costs, Reminding people that the drivers actually remind drivers that you know people are constantly on their phones as a, as a driver. You have to watch out for uh, people on their phones as they're crossing the road. I was like, wow, times have changed. Any Pokemon Go players here? Does this still exist? Why are you still playing it? Man, I, you know, I, I, the amount of times I've actually walked almost walked into somebody um, deliberately because of it. I just wanted to kind of knock into them. Um, I saw this, you know, funny photo of uh, Pokemon Go. You know, it's really something. Like, you know, as a parent, I feel like this myself, which you can see a picture of later on. You know, I, I, for the time, I can't understand why people are going out there changing things. But it's amazing, right? We think about all the different uh, apps um, and, and, and applications, you know, on a mobile device that people are using on a daily basis. It's just really evolved. Uh, when we think of, of information and technology, uh, you know, it comes in so many different ways. Uh, you know, we, we receive it's sort of a constant influx of, of information that's, that's hitting us every day, every second, every minute. And our brain can only process that much of it. Right? So how do we make sense of all that information that's coming at us, to us, by us, you know, sharing it with, with other people? You know, back to the millennial study, right? 67% of millennials uh, read that you can find a YouTube video on anything they want to learn or find. Uh, and, and this is this is so true. I think you know as as a company, you know Google started as a company in 1998, we're actually 18 years old, so we finally uh, we're almost getting out of the teens. Um, but over you know the last 18 years, we've seen how search has evolved. Right? In the past, we want to find something, we would just go into the Google search engine and look for something. But over the last couple of years, that search has really evolved and, and moved to video. And this is, this is interesting because when you think of things like how to play the xylophone, how to play, if you type how to play you know, um, the xylophone on, on um, that, that's a xylophone, okay. uh, you know, you learn how to play a xylophone, uh, and you come back to Google Sites, you get a whole bunch of text instructions. I mean, just, you know, it's, it's, it's helpful, but it's not, it's not going to really teach you. But when you come back to, Google, uh, to YouTube, and we can actually see you know, like uh, somebody playing a xylophone, like it changes the way that you learn. And not only that, you can then take a video of yourself playing a xylophone and then upload that to YouTube and cross off and get feedback. Right, so video is really changing the, the medium of, of instruction of learning. Uh, and it's two way. Right, so it's amazing when we think about YouTube. This is my daughter, uh, she was, in this picture she was four years old, Emma. Uh, and Emma was, um, you know, you can see here, she, she, she's making a Mother's Day gift uh, for my wife. So she's making a Mother's Day gift, she's like, Daddy, I need, I, need to, I need to pack something. And you can see, like, you know, she included a photo of herself, because she loves mom and blah, blah, blah. She included a fake flower, you know, from her bathroom. Uh, she made a card, that's probably the only thing she actually made. And then, uh, you know, her favorite DVD, Mulan, and a hack clip of mom. So basically giving mom everything, but back to the uh, but she wanted to wrap all of this stuff up. She said, hey, how do I wrap this? You know, I want to make a nice gift bag. And, you know, I, I, I thought to myself, man, every Christmas, the, my wrapping is, you know, this stuff is cut it, right? She wanted to make a bag, one of those fancy bags where you had to put things in. I see some people nodding, and all the guys are like, no. <laughs> she wanted to make a bag, so what do we do? She said, I said, Daddy doesn't know how to do it. And then Emma looked at me and said, can we ask you to? So she went and asked YouTube, so we went onto YouTube and said, how do you, how do you make a wrapping bag? Oh, you know, and, and she, she typed it in and then, you know, the video came out. She learned how to do it in four minutes. She, fought, she had to pause it, replay it, pause it, replay it a few times. But she figured out how to learn to make a wrapping bag uh, from a YouTube video. You know, it's amazing when we think about, you know, the, the types of technologies that are, that are with us today. This is a, a great example of, uh, this is how I do parenting, uh, as, as an example. So I kind of did the lesson. Uh, 
Why is it red? Because its surface is made of iron oxide. Why do they call it Mars? Well, it was named after the Roman god of war. This This idea of CS plus X, you know, one of the things that at Google that we tell a lot is, is you know, teaching um, kids how to do computational thinking. Uh, you know, the idea of you know, computer, computational science, computer science, when you add computer science to any discipline, it gives you a whole different approach to doing things, right? We've got a couple examples here. Um, so you may add, you know, CS, computer science plus physics, computer science plus biology, computer science plus retail. A lot of these, you know, new industries have been created as a result of, of you know, computer it really evolved, you know, the way that we use some of the more traditional things. Now, well, why is that important, right? Because computational thinking for us is not just about creating the next generation of computer scientists or software engineers, but really it's a different approach to solving problems, you know, recognizing patterns, analyzing them, you know, and, and you know, deciphering what, what's important. And anybody with an engineering background here? A of people. It's just a very different approach. Uh, you know, to, to problem solving. And why, why is this important? When you think about, you know, the, our, our economy today, by some of these companies, which I'm going to talk about, Uber, you know, world's largest taxi company, they own no vehicles. Um, same thing happening in the world's largest foundation provider, they own no real estate. Right? I think they do, you know, something like um, half a million states and night now, globally. And it's, 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 it's amazing when you think about the scale that these people have reached, right? I mean, even the traditional um, hotel chains like Marriott and, and Hyatt, right? They own a lot of real estate, but they can't grow as quickly as these guys because really it's, it's all about the capacity in the world. Um, Facebook, the world's most popular media provider, they, they own no content. Everything is, is, is you guys uploading pictures and photos of what you ate for breakfast, what you can did, you know, everything that's on there uh, is user generated content. And Alibaba, the most large retailer, they were in the Chino Magic Carrier in stock. Just amazing, right? All these companies, you know, have, have, have trumped over uh, or are rising and, and <coughs> becoming so common in, in, in everyday lives now that they've overtaken a lot of traditional uh, industries in the, in the hotel, automotive uh, industries, and it's amazing to see. You know, what a little bit of technology can really change. At Google, you know, one of the things that we care about is, is, is obviously machine learning. Uh, we've started to develop, you know, heavily into applications you can see here and understand you based on where you are, based on what you're doing, based on your past behavior, and really giving you information even before you need it. Right? So, a couple of examples here where you, know, you can do live translation of, of science, right? how do you translate something that you, you don't know what it is? Um, and so, you know, we're really excited. I think that we've invested in the, you know, into this space, and, and so have a lot of our partners and, and developers. Um, you know, in, in all of our products, right? And I can go through this, this whole list of, of things where all of the user behavior is really giving us more information about how we can improve the products uh, over time and give you information before you need it. Um, our friends at TextHelp, uh, you know, Barbara uh, and T, you know, they, they also do a lot. You know, invest a lot into, into machine learning and it's, it's amazing to see you know some of the examples of how you know when you think about these things as you're using a Google Docs, as you're using you know some of these applications we didn't we didn't drive. I mean it's, it's amazing that the real time um, you know learning that happens on the back end that really improves uh, the product over time. And so as millions and millions of users are you know typing in Google Docs in, in slides and, and so forth, right? It's constantly improving and innovating. So it's really exciting, I think, to see this space uh, grow tremendously over the past couple of years. So those of you who used um, you know, the, the, the G Suite uh, application or what you've been on Google Apps for years, you know what a long way it's come. And it's amazing. You know. So how, do, how does that change your role? Right? We've, we've talked about the technology. How does that change your role? You know, I went, I went on, again, I went on Google and, and found a, a word a word on sort of the different roles Remember I said, when you came to education, to teach. And really, 
tips and goals and think about how your interactions with your students right, or your fellow teachers or peers have, have really changed over that time. And it's, it's amazing, I think, you know, you guys have to adapt, but you have to adapt with your students as well, right? Um, anybody write presentations then by John Reynolds? Love this book. Um, you know, if you, if you have a fear of public speaking, if you're presenting on a crowd, I mean, it's a great book uh, to read, uh, just because of all the different stories and examples. And in, uh, you know, so I'll summarize a couple of my favorite points here. You know, God talks about teaching stories. Because people relate to stories and they remember stories earlier. If I asked you, you know, how many of you remember the list of the Google products that had the machine learning in them? Probably, you know, you'd be pretty good at getting half of them. But if I asked you, you know, how many of you remember the story I told about Emma trying to wrap the president for her mom? I'm sure pretty much everyone can remember that story. So teaching the stories is important because people relate and they remember stories. Um, pictures are, are really important as well. You know, there's, there's actually a scientific research that shows uh, you know, people retain information a lot better when you have uh, pictures uh, than just words. So, you know, the good old adage of that by PowerPoint, you just have bullet points on your slide, you can kill people. Um, and the whole thing I'm just randomly I think it's hilarious. You know, people get amazed by it, and I'm blown away by big numbers. The right message and design matters. Um, you know, this, I can't overstate this. You know, this. I was, when, I, when I saw this image, I was like, man, if they had designed it the other way around. You know, so instead of being too good to be drunk, you put the pencil on, on your edge, and then so you, as you're sharpening it, because <laughs> drugs can all be erased for us. Um, the right message and, and design matter, how, how you interact with your students, uh, you know, the lesson plans that you're putting in place, you know, getting your, your, your kids to take ownership of their learning. So you got to put all of these in you know, a and I, I think, you know, really, really makes a difference. For us, collaborations, we, you know, at Google, we, we always work in groups, nobody works alone. I suspect that's true, very true in education as well. You know, encouraging kids to work together. Um, you know, this is one of the, the key skills. I think, you know, there was a, there was a survey that's done on the Fortune 500 CEO companies. Um, and a lot of CEOs put collaboration and team working as the top skill that they look for when hiring prospective candidates. And you know, nobody in this day and age, nobody really works alone. I, I, I believe you guys as teachers too, you work with other teachers, right? You can really work by yourself. So how do you encourage and foster collaboration among your students? You know, this is really critical. Building a culture of problem solving. If you ever visited a Facebook office, you see this sign on the right here, uh, pasted all around their offices, which I think is, 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 a, is a really good message. But nothing at Facebook is somebody else's problem. If you find a problem, sure, you can you know, tell your boss about it, but really your boss is going to say, how would you solve it? And so how do you, how do you develop this, this culture of problem solving within your students? I know our friend said that, you know, when I visited Jay when he was still at uh, Central American School, in every classroom, they have a sign that's posted uh, ask three before me. And the three that Basically, you've got to ask three things before you ask the teacher. The three things are, have you asked Google, have you asked YouTube, and have you asked your peers? Okay. If you consulted those three things and you still don't know the answer, then come and ask me. And so this culture of problem solving, go solve the problem. If you find a problem, don't tell me the problem, go, go find the answer first before you evaluate what your options are. Uh, and all I want is to speak up. You know, at Google, we, you know, we have a very bottom-up um, culture where you know, employees can voice uh, concerns uh, at a weekly office meeting that we have in, in every office around the world. Uh, we call it TGF, so it helps that it's done over the year and snacks, but um, you know, encouraging employees to speak up is important because oftentimes we get a lot of feedback from people working with our customers, with our partners, with our users. This is, uh, you know, I found this, uh, this is you know, really nice. If you ever want to put this in your CV as the you are the 2006 person of the year. This is a good way to do it because the 2006 Time Magazine person of the book of the year is you. So I see people actually put this in their CV. It's amazing. I was like, wow, oh, this person was 2006 Time Magazine person of the year. And when I look up to see whether his face was really on the cover, I just said you. Um, you know, be the very first version of yourself, right? Which is sort of the takeaway that I want you guys to, to take from, from my session today is, you know, how do you, how do you find ways 
to improve upon the very best, the, the, the very you know, uh, current version of yourself. When you came into education, when you decided to become a teacher, I'm sure your role has evolved. So how do you continuously you know, get better and, and, and improve? I love this quote from uh, ex-president uh, Barack Obama, talking about you know, teachers being the greatest resource at your school. Right? You guys have obviously given up your weekends to be here uh, to constantly improve upon, upon you know, what you can do in the classroom. And I think that's such a wonderful testament to, to you know, your, your, your own careers, right? Constantly improve and get better. Um, I love this quote, you know, again, our friends at Tech Talk, you know, sent me some information here. Right? Talking about reading and, and encouraging kids to read. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's so important. There's a lot of scientific data, you know, that, that goes into, you know, if you encourage kids to read at a young age, you know, they retain information a lot better, they process information a lot better. Uh, and, and they become more confident by right? reading stories, becoming storytellers. You see, there's a common thread that happens here, right? Uh, switching gears a little bit, and then, you know, and then I'll wrap up uh, soon. You know, Google's a company, this is, this is where Google started, uh, in, in a garage. We started in this lady, Garage Susan, who's now head of YouTube, um, in, back in 1998. Our father's there, he's still getting at Stanford University, right, long story. Um, and they started in this garage. This was the humble beginnings of Google as a company in, in 1998. And over time, you know, we, we really evolved into, you know, what are some of the big challenges that we can we can solve in the world? When we think about, you know, there's about seven billion people on Earth today, and only about two billion people have access to the internet. So two billion out of seven billion people have access to the internet. And when we think about internet, so access to information, access, access to knowledge. There's still a lot of people out there that have, that have limited access to, to information and knowledge. And so how do we how do we build this future where everyone can participate? You really, it's, it's the stuff that we care about. How do we bring the next billion users online? You know, our our chairman, uh, Eric Smith, he visited North Korea, um, I think at the start of last year actually, or oh, maybe the end of 2015. And he, when he came back from his trip, he told us this story of you know, when he visited, when he was visiting North Korea, obviously they are very um, stringent on what you they allow you to see and what they don't allow you to see. But he got a chance to interact with, you know, uh, some, some you know, North Korean uh, citizens that they allow the, the visitors to interact with. And he was saying that there's, there's so much thirst for information. Like, they just want to know what's it like outside of North Korea. Right? So the, the, the need for or accessing information you know, across this, you know, so many barriers, uh, even in places that you know we're, we're striving to get into, uh, is amazing. As a company, we have we now have seven products uh, that have more than a billion users. I'm going to quiz you guys on it as we go through this in some of my workshops. But we have uh, seven products that have more than a billion users, and that is sort of the benchmark as a company that we look at uh, how many active users we have. And so obviously, start with to search. Um, it starts with search, you know, so as a company we only have to more than a billion users in search. But then when, when you know, over time, you know, we've, we've always built and, and acquired uh, companies as well. So we acquired YouTube in 2005 or six, I think. And really YouTube for us has, has changed uh, the way that we look at the world and the way that we see people consuming information. Um, there are a lot of, um, obviously a lot of videos on and a lot of uh, videos. I think this number's not the other way. Uh, incidentally, there are you know one million more cat videos than dog videos. I don't know about cat videos, but I dog and dog. But every minute that passes now, there's almost 500 hours of YouTube video that's being uploaded. Let's say that again. Every 60 seconds that we sit here, there's almost 500 hours of video being uploaded to YouTube. So even if you spend the rest of your life watching YouTube, you won't be able to catch up with everything that's on there. Right? The scale by which you know, people are uh, uh, creating content, and I'm building content, it's, it's amazing. Um, the, you know, this, uh, you ever seen the nine cat? You can actually find a 10-hour video of this constantly on YouTube. It's amazing. <laughs> you know, there's so many, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, I guess this counts as a cat for you. Uh, a lot of content that's on there. And over time, you know, we've, we've gone into many other, many other areas, right? So, 
you know, Max as a company actually started in Australia, uh, in our Sydney office. Um, you know, back in 2003, we acquired um, a company for where two technologies had evolved into Google Maps. So a lot of the engineering in, in Sydney now is still Google Maps for business. I'll come back to a story on why Maps is my favorite product. So these are my two kids. Uh, we were in Melbourne uh, at this um, museum. Uh, it's a kids' museum, and they were reading a book, uh, you know, in the gift store of the, of the museum. And and you know, Ryan, you know, so that's sorry, that Ryan's Ryan's eight, Emma, well, at that time he's seven, and she was four. Um, and Ryan came across this book. He loves maps. I think he really loves maps. Uh, and he came across this book uh, in the in the bookstore. And he said, "Oh, daddy, can we buy this book?" And like most parents, the first thing I did was I turned it around and looked at how much it cost. Um, so I looked at the price, and I was like, right, it's quite expensive. Uh, and and I, 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 I said to him, how about, you know, if we have a couple of math books at home, we've got a couple of atlases, like real paper atlases at home, how about we go home and we can draw our own maps, right, make up our own maps. And Ryan, you know, Ryan said, all right, and let's do that. And, and so we did that. We actually, you know, we built a jigsaw as well. We built a, jig, a whole jigsaw of the, of the whole map. So these kids were we gave them some tracing paper. They started tracing, you know, the map. And eventually, they, they, you know, you can see it as they're coloring. Great, no screen time. Um, you know, they were they were doing this pretty diligently. You know, you see Ryan came up with his atlas. He made a whole atlas in the end, uh, which was which was wonderful. And they had a whole uh, paper map that they colored in. And why is this important? Uh, you know, for me, when, when I think about the world and there's so much, you know, there's so much to see around the world. You know, I, for me myself, I came, you know, flying here from Sydney. I mean, it's a long way to come. And so before, before I travel, I always sit down with Ryan and Max and I, I show them this is where he's going. I'm going to do this on Google Maps, right? Which led to a whole set of different questions around why is the map, why is the world not flat? And, you know, so, anyway, so we started talking about about um, where he's going, you know, what country, what what um, what continent, and so forth, and what's happening there. And I showed them Google Maps, and they've been so amazed. They've been so amazed with uh, Google Maps because I don't know if you guys have seen, you know, Google Maps if you actually switch to Earth view and you zoom out, it actually zooms out into the globe, uh, so you can actually see the planet and how it spins. And, and and it's amazing when when you know people, you know, the very first time kids see technology that they've never seen. It like blows their mind, right? And so for me, uh, you know, it came, all of this came to, uh, you know, when, when I watched this, when you see live, is that come on here? You don't see live. Well, now we have a lot of Academy uh, 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 Awards, I don't think you won, but this is based on a true story. It's based on a true story about um, an Indian boy uh, who he got adopted out to a family in, in, in Australia and he used Google Maps you know, after 25 years to find his way home. So I'll show this video, which for me is, is the wonders of what technology can do. It was 26 years ago and I was just about to turn five. We got to the train station and we thought we were trying to get a little brother to set our stay here and we'll come back. I just thought, well, you know, my mum's just going to sleep and just wake me up. And when I wake up the next day, the whole carriage is empty. When I run my train, the ghost train taking me and I don't know where. I was adopted out to Australia to a Australian family. And mum had decorated my room with the map of India and she put it next to my bedside. I woke up every morning seeing that map. And hence, it sort of kept the memories alive. So you're trying to find an evil haystack so you didn't find it. But I have flashes of the place I used to go, the flashes of my family faces. There was the image of my mother sitting down with her legs crossed, just watching her cry. Life is just so hard. That was my treasure. And I was looking at Google Map and realised there's Google Earth as well. The world we could zoom into, I started to have all these thoughts in the world possibilities that this could do for me. I said to myself, well, you know, you've got all the photographic memories and landmarks where you're from and you know what the town looks like. This could be an application that you can use to find your way back. I thought I'd put a, a dock on a Calcutta train station and a radius line that, you know, you should be searching around this area. I sort of came across these train tracks and I started 
bunch of kids. We were, <laughs> uh, you know, we were all somewhat idealistic in our own way. I did not pay nails. We wanted to do things that made a difference in the world and that, uh, you know, that mattered, right? That were interesting and hard. We didn't start out as a conventional company and we never followed the normal path. On the one hand, it was a perfect description of what we were trying to accomplish in search. And yet, it was also so broad as to leave the door open for all the many, many directions we wanted to go in the future. We set up something very really useful for people and all the other things people can follow. Alright, so here we are. Uh, yeah. I don't think any of us possibly could have seen where this story was going to go. It may sound nuts, but it's often. are crazy enough to try, and those are usually the ones who want to work with. What if this does well that the barrier is truly going for? Can we bring the internet to the five billion people who don't have it today? If you want to share something, you can put it from here, you don't need it. What if everyone in the world could speak every language? What if everyone can make a living doing what they love? Almost everything we do as an experiment in some way, shape, or form. Everything has some aspect of the unknown. <laughs> You're probably going to fail a few times before you succeed. And then the car is control. We always tend to ask the question, how can we make it better? So there's always a sense of optimism and curiosity that we can make a difference. If our ambition is to create products that have planetary impact, it's not good enough to just solve it. For some people, you have to solve it for absolutely everyone. Things that I think that is what it is, seeing something doesn't work that well, and trying to use technology to make it better. Wow, I thought it. That is fantastic. We want to get deeper into the problems that really matter to people and to the world. Just because we've been successful in the past doesn't mean we're preordained to succeed in the future. That's why we need to keep on asking the big questions and work really hard to find the best answers.
while. I, I was in a, actually, it was a hotel in, in Asia. I was saying, and I went in, and I was uh, secure, going into my room, was like locking the door, and I, I looked, and you know those little chains that you, like, you pull over, and you put in a little slot, and then it slides over, and it's supposed to bend, you know, it's supposed to stop you from opening the door? They had put the, the thing on the wrong way, right, the little slider, so it meant that every time you pulled it, it would just, like, flop out. And I thought, right, yeah, we'll do one job, just put that thing on the right way, and you couldn't, you couldn't mess it up, but sometimes it does happen. A um, uh, couple of things here at the end uh, before we get a break, our break for our next session. Uh, the GEG communities um, here in Taiwan are very, very active. Um, there are quite a few of them, and one, it's one of the things on your bingo card is to sign up for a GEG. So the Google Educator groups have grassroots um, uh, groups that are working together to help uh, other teachers in their area uh, upskill themselves and become better at integrating technology. So check that out, uh, the GEGs. There's also, uh, at the end of this uh, event, we will then uh, be uh, signing you up for our community. Um, and it's a community that will host hangouts on air, uh, has resources, has uh, opportunities for you to network and to share with other people around the world. We also have a Facebook community as well. If we can Facebook, um, you can look that up and you can see some information there about joining and staying connected. So that's really what you need to think about now or start thinking about is how do I continue learning even after all of this is over? Uh, we also have offered a device grant program, so a portion of the money we make from these events goes back to the schools. And so if you're interested in applying for one of those grants, um, the last one was uh, given to a school in Canada. You can check out edtechteam.com slash grant, and you can see a picture there of some, some kids that are enjoying the new devices that they just got. So our first session today starts at 10 o'clock. Please refresh the schedule. Um, the one way that you should be able to tell if you have the most recent version is that in session 7, there's a breakout EDU uh, session there. And there is, in the description of that, there's a link. It's actually the same link as from yesterday. I just added a new sheet to that tab, if you want to, or a new tab to that sheet, if you want to sign up for that. So we'll start at 10 o'clock, and uh, if you remember at the end of lunch, please drop your bingo cards off to me at the bridge desk, and you'll be able to draw for the win of the prize. Thanks, have a good day.